talking about latent TB management in Australia is, um, uh, it has its challenges. Uh, you know, as, as you've heard from some of the, the previous speakers, latent TB uh, can be a little bit invisible. We don't see people who are sick. Um, uh, we all recognize the curse of the uh, public health uh, professional in that anything that you prevent by definition doesn't happen and so no one notices. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, have some ways to put a, a bit of a story around this and think, well, you know, what, what is the story of latent TB management in Australia just at the moment? Um, uh, unfortunately, I've got some test audiences at home, and uh, I tried out a couple of prototypes of my children who weren't that receptive, and I thought I was overly complicating the situation. But my, my seven-year-old said, oh, gee, Dad, you know, this is so easy, you just need to use your hand. I thought, oh, what, what do you mean? She goes, well, Damien, this is her teacher in grade two, Damien said that stories are all about who, what, where, when, and why. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, I can, I can, we can use that. So what, what's the who, what, where, when, and why of latent tuberculosis in Australia. Okay. And what I'd like to do just very quickly over this period of time is, is to give you a, a little bit of a, um, a heavily biased view of what this looks like at the moment for latent TB in Australia, uh, both in terms of the story that we have up until this point in time, but also maybe a little bit about where the story might go. Uh, and so I'm going to leave you, I hope, with some unanswered questions for this group for each of these things. So let's start with this question of, of who, who has latent TB in Australia. Um, I, I think that uh, we have an in, uh, a sort of intuitive sense about this which is pretty strong. You know, we sort of recognize that uh, people, for example, who are born in Australia and grow up here are not, are, are not high risk of TB, and so we think about people who've had <coughs> opportunities for exposure overseas. So if we try to put a few numbers around that, we might start by saying that uh, 27% of the Australian population uh, at the time of the last census was born overseas. It gives us a little bit of something, but maybe not enough to be particularly helpful for us in, in shaping what kind of way we answer that question. So there's a number of ways that we might get a little more detailed about that and try to make some advances into a more useful way to say who. And I'd just like to show you a couple of slides that have been particularly put together uh, by Katie Dale, who's a, a PhD student of uh, James Trowers and I, who uh, has been working on, on some of these questions. And so one place that she started was by uh, breaking down a little bit of this census data as to uh, where it is that people come from. And this is a, just one image of that where we're looking at the uh, census data and saying where did people come from who had migrated to Australia and in what year did they come? And if we look at this just very quickly we see a, a couple of trends. These are just some higher incidence TB countries that we've pulled out, a number of which have been mentioned already this morning. And we can see some specific patterns, uh, uh, people coming from uh, Vietnam in large numbers in the, the late 70s and early 80s, uh, later uh, from, uh, from India, China, the Philippines. Uh, but overall, the, the cumulative numbers that we can see here really do support the fact that um, over recent decades, we have seen uh, uh, increasing numbers of people coming from a variety of places where they may have been more likely to be exposed to TB than perhaps some other countries of migration. Now, that gives us another little bit of information, but it still doesn't really get us to the heart of who is it uh, that has latent TB in Australia? So she's been looking for uh, a few other windows that we could use to take this uh, data a little bit further and turn it into something that is perhaps a bit more programmatically uh, useful. Uh, and one of those windows came with some work that uh, some of you will be familiar with that um, uh, Ryan Hubin and Pete Dodd have done over the last few years, uh, trying to re-estimate the global burden of latent tuberculosis infection. Now, I won't go into this in, in great detail, but essentially what they've done is they've looked at all of the available data sources they could to try to estimate what the annual risk of TB infection was in essentially every country and region around the world over uh, a very long period of time. And use that data to build up some pictures about how likely people are to have been infected with TB over the course of their lives. And so at this particular snapshot, uh, coming up with their estimate of uh, around about a quarter of the world's population being uh, infected with latent TB at this time. So, Katie's very interested in uh, how we could uh, take those things and put them together and perhaps use these estimates of annual risk of TB infection 
from lots of different global settings and how we could overlay that into uh, our information here about people who had uh, migrated to Australia at particular times in their lives and so what sort of cumulative risk they might have. Um, let me put a little bit of a face on this by taking just one um, anonymized person from the 2016 census and walking him through it. Uh, so <laughs> this, this anonymous individual um, was born overseas. Maybe a shock to some of you. Uh, he was born in Canada in 1979, and in 1989 migrated to, uh, I'm sorry Philip, we did promise we wouldn't mention <laughs> anything about this gentleman, however, we'll move on. So, uh, in effect, what we're talking about doing is saying, between 1979 and 1989, we have a particular risk each year of TB infection, and the annual risk of TB infection, and then the same is true for uh, Australia between 1989 and 2016. The risk of being infected with TB in Australia is lower than most parts of the world, but it's, it's still there. And so we then take that individual uh, over the course of their lives up until the 2016 census, and we say, as they go through each of those years of exposure, what is their cumulative risk of having been infected with TB to, to arrive at their overall risk at the time of the, the census? Um, the rest is pretty easy. You just repeat that process 23,401,892 times, uh, and you get a, uh, an overall estimate of the, um, the prevalence of latent TB in Australia, and then uh, can do some slightly more sophisticated things with it. Uh, a couple of quick snapshots uh, around this that, um, uh, that start to emerge from this stuff. Uh, the, the first is that uh, this is also something She's done for 2006 and 2011, so we've got some trends uh, that I'll just show you very quickly here. Uh, first of all, seeing that in terms of raw numbers of people with latent TB, uh, we see this increasing over this period of time. Uh, so in 2016, we're talking overall about uh, around about 1.1 million people uh, in Australia estimated by this method to have been infected with latent TB. And uh, not a lot of surprise, um, the considerable majority of those coming from uh, people born overseas. Uh, a couple of interesting things that I won't spend a lot of time on, but uh, these numbers are much smaller. There is a slight increase there, and overall we're talking about uh, just over 5% uh, of the uh, Australian population uh, infected with latent TB. Uh, interestingly, the, the individual risk uh, of people being infected with latent TB has fallen over that time, but because uh, numbers of people coming from higher <laughs> settings has increased proportionately or disproportionately, we see an overall rise in the number of uh, latent TB cases overall. And, and this provides some framework that, uh, that we can then go on to do lots of other things, uh, looking at risk of reactivation for those people by mapping to uh, uh, national TB data, uh, or looking uh, more geographically, for instance, to see what the distribution of those uh, people are uh, showing. Again, I won't go into any detail, but uh, I don't think we'll be surprised to see uh, a higher density of people's uh, postcodes of residence in uh, urban areas, uh, particularly around Sydney and Denmark. So, uh, a couple of quick uh, snapshots there uh, towards the question of who has latent TB. Um, and uh, there are lots of outstanding questions about this stuff. And for me, uh, this is one of the outstanding questions that we're working towards, which is, okay, maybe we can better define this question of who might be latently infected in Australia. Now, what groups of people are at enough risk for us to think about routine testing and treatment of latent TB? Um, and uh, this particular project is going to go into some uh, modeling approaches to trying to define optimal risk thresholds around that, uh, but there are lots of different ways you'd appreciate that those questions need to be answered in our context. So, that's who. What about what? What will we treat people with when we find that they have latent TB and we think that they are at sufficient risk uh, to uh, try to prevent the development of active disease? Um, what, what are we going to treat them with? Uh, here's a, a small uh, randomized control trial that we've recently published uh, looking at one particular aspect of that, 
which is uh, around uh, the cost effectiveness of using uh, a therapy, which I think is uh, probably familiar to, to most clinicians in the room, but may not be to uh, others in non-clinical backgrounds, uh, which is a short course, uh, weekly isonized and rifepintin, um, uh, compared to uh, what is uh, otherwise more commonly used here, a daily isoniazid based regimen. So uh, a little bit of background to that. Uh, some years ago, well, we have long been using either six or nine months uh, of isoniazid for uh, latent TB treatment in Australia, and uh, in Victoria we've tended to use more, than, more of nine months of standard of care. Uh, but some years ago now, uh, there were large international randomized control trials, uh, particularly uh, from Tim Sterling's group, uh, comparing these two regimens. And showing, uh, overall, we'll just say that they're equivalent, although I think most of us tend to think um, uh, trends towards increased uh, effectiveness, actually, with the, um, with the shorter course regimen for lots of reasons. And uh, we had international guidelines, and uh, over the intervening years, we now have these regimens which are used in a variety of different settings around the world, and uh, even considered uh, preferential in some contexts. Uh, but we have had this question about where Australia is in all of this, and, and where we would be. So at the time, um, we decided that uh, there was no well, capacity or need actually to look at um, uh, effectiveness of this therapy, which had been well established. Um, in, instead, what we were interested in was a feasibility uh, and particularly cost effectiveness in our, our session. So we uh, undertook this small uh, single center randomized control trial uh, where we uh, randomized one to one to those two uh, regimens and, and for obvious reasons uh, without blinding. Uh, it's hard to blind people to a daily nine month therapy versus a weekly three month therapy. Um, and we were really primarily interested in uh, the outcomes of, of cost there. And this is um, uh, for the health economists in the room, we're particularly interested in um, uh, healthcare uh, costs uh, in this setting. Um, we ran this uh, over a three year period of time. Uh, and uh, at the end of that, it enrolled the uh, 80 patients that we planned to do. And just to quickly look through a few of these things, uh, essentially we, we found that both of these uh, therapies were very well tolerated. 85%, um, 90% uh, uh, treatment completion of those who were uh, enrolled, uh, no serious adverse effects. Uh, one patient in the short course arm who was hospitalized with what was considered by the clinicians to be a, uh, an unrelated viral illness. Although I think in retrospect, uh, we have much greater recognition actually of some uh, febrile reactions commonly associated with this regime and so may well have been associated. Um, and when we come to comparing the two from a cost effectiveness point of view, looking at the services, that's come out a little bit small here, but I'll, I'll just highlight a couple of short parts. The, the, this first one here is the number of outpatient visits that were taken up. And, uh, uh, unsurprisingly, the, um, the nine-month course of isoniazid, uh, a median of uh, five outpatient visits versus a median of three outpatient visits for the short course regime, and uh, no difference in terms of uh, pathology tests that were ordered. Uh, clinicians had some scope to order as was necessary, uh, or was considered necessary, and uh, yeah, no difference in uh, pathology ordering between the two regimes. When we come to talk about costs, can break this down a little bit more, um, and if we look across pathology and radiology testing, the cost of outpatient visits. Um, so pathology and radiology testing, pretty similar. Uh, we had that one hospitalization for the short course regime, and some cost savings associated with less outpatient costs. We then have uh, this <coughs> column here, which is about the cost of the medication itself. Uh, there's some difficulties about that. Rifepentin is not a licensed preparation uh, in Australia. And so we, uh, for this uh, study, incorporated the, uh, the current international costs, converted into AUD. Um, but if we, look, uh, if we look at some variation around that, essentially we found that uh, even for um, costs that were up to either a half or twice the international cost, uh, we still had uh, significant cost savings using the short course ratio because of those savings, particularly from less outpatient follow-up. So, at least for us in our context, we, we felt that um, there's, there's not a lot really going for the longer course regimes. Okay? They are, uh, well, the shorter course are cost effective. Uh, we know from uh, lots of other studies, including this one, that patients prefer it. Uh, 
that they're well tolerated overall. Um, and the barriers that we have here are, are really uh, logistic. So we, ripopentine is not currently licensed uh, in Australia. Uh, not many centers have felt it worthwhile to, um, to push ahead with this with uh, SAS schemes or other forms of access that we've got. And so really waiting for the availability of uh, ripopentine. And the other logistic question I've just alluded to here is, is of course, that um, uh, along with uh, availability uh, may well be different formulations. And so um, there are currently moves to license internationally fixed dose combinations uh, of rifopentine and isoniazid. And it may well be that we have the opportunity to, um, uh, to access those directly uh, once, they are, uh, once they are licensed and made available in Australia. This question of what cost? Uh, is going to be an important one, though, um, because uh, if uh, Australian pricing fits in with uh, international experience, uh, we think that this will be uh, very cost effective. Uh, but the reality is that there's a lot of uncertainties about those things, and so this is going to be something else in our story that we're going to need to uh, watch uh, closely as it evolves. So what, who, and what, and when? Um, when should we test the latent TV? Well, there's something a little bit new in this story that I, I thought I would introduce here. Uh, Chris, it's good that you're here with us because this is a good opportunity for us to talk about uh, a fairly recent NTAC document, uh, a new national position statement for the management of latent tuberculosis infection. Um, now, there's some things in here that are uh, codifying things that we've all known and talked about for a long time. And uh, if we look at uh, some of the recommendations here, I think we'll see uh, not a lot of surprise. Okay. So I think if I told you that uh, NTAC recommends the following groups are tested for latent TB, those identified by contact tracing within Australia. Sure. People with HIV or those who are about to have uh, immunosuppressive therapies or organ transplantations, not a lot of surprises there for us. But I think some people that I've spoken to are a bit surprised to see that there are um, actually some other groups that are also recommended for uh, testing for latent TB. Uh, which includes uh, migrants from any country with a history of TB contact, or migrants from countries with a high incidence of TB who are aged under the age of 35, uh, or over 35, and have one or more risk factors for reactivation. Um, those risk factors include the things that we've talked about here that we recognize, but actually also increase, uh, include a, a larger group, which includes um, uh, some History findings, evidence of recent infection we've talked about, um, but particularly as, uh, as Philip was just talking about, some comorbidities which can importantly increase the risk of uh, TB reactivation, uh, including diabetes uh, and um, uh, chronic kidney disease. So uh, a larger group of things that, uh, some of which are recommended and some of which we are starting to think about the boundaries of uh, when latent TB should be tested for. We do also have a number of outstanding questions about when latent TB should be tested for. And I think this is one that often comes up, which is uh, if we think that individuals who are migrating from uh, regions of high TB incidence are likely to have a latent TB, uh, where is the possibility for uh, testing, offering treatment to uh, protect and preserve the long-term health of, uh, of new Australians around us? and also as part of our strategies towards reducing TB incidence. Um, I don't intend to offer any answers to that question today, but I think this is a question that we need to continue to ask uh, and to invite a variety of perspectives on. It's worth saying that uh, there are some steps in this uh, direction. So since 2016, uh, children under the age of 12 have had some form of latent TB screening uh, as part of the migration pathway. And there are ongoing discussions about what other factors uh, might be relevant in terms of thinking uh, uh, who is at sufficient risk of development of active TB that, uh, that uh, introduction of routine testing may be worth considering. Where, okay, good. Where should we treat latent TB? Um, th this is something that's been uh, of interest to me uh, partly as a, a program director because uh, when we start to talk about those numbers that I shared with you right at the beginning, we start to think about the 1.1 million people 
currently living in Australia who are estimated to have Latin TV. Now, I, I don't know um, the numbers from lots of other programs, but I know that uh, for Victoria, when we think about um, contact tracing, uh, we work pretty hard. And we managed last year to screen something like 1,900 people uh, for latent TB because we've identified that they were potentially at risk. Now, there's some more screening that probably happens in the community. I think there are some rheumatologists out there who, who did a, a quantiferon without telling me about it and before they started a, a, a TNF alpha inhibitor. Um, but I'd be surprised if there was uh, twice as much again. And when we start to talk about some of these big numbers, I think we also start to think about um, the feasibility of some of the systems that we have in place for being able to, um, uh, to test and follow up people safely. And so uh, for us, one of the ways that we've been trying to grapple with that is uh, by trying to articulate that issue in our uh, new strategic plan for Victoria, which includes a number of things that I won't talk about. Uh, but one in particular is around uh, providing support for general practice latent TB diagnosis and treatment. Okay. A number of things that come along with that. Um, that looks like a, a lot of different things for us. Um, a, a couple of key features towards the way that we have been uh, initiating pilot projects around this. Here's one example uh, that, that we've done. So, this is a training program that we did with uh, largely refugee health uh, nurses and uh, GP, uh, GPs working in, in uh, high case load clinics. We look to identify local partners. So this is a tertiary hospital uh, which is close by to where this um, particular group of GP clinics was, was based. We look to tailor that to local needs. Uh, and so we focused that in the context of other refugee health issues. We thought about how this would fit into current workflows in that context. Um, we want to emphasize practical community-based care. So the, uh, the intention here is, is not simply to set up another funnel to tertiary care programs, um, but actually to think uh, holistically about uh, who and how uh, and what and where and we can manage people in the community uh, around latent TB diagnosis and treatment. Um, and for, for this particular program, uh, the way we uh, did that was to set up a, a number of uh, teaching sessions uh, fo uh, focused on um, uh, clinical cases, uh, but then also to provide uh, GPs with the opportunity to come into tertiary infectious diseases and respiratory clinics to sit in with those clinics uh, that were managing latent TB infection, uh, partly to give them a flavor of how some of these issues have worked out in practice, uh, but partly also because we want to keep linking back to local partners. We want people to have uh, therapeutic relationships where uh, GPs feel comfortable to call someone that they've worked with uh, and ask them questions about some of the challenging issues that come up. Um, how we are focusing the clinical pathways here is on trying to say not, can we manage all latent TB in the community? Because I think uh, we would all have some concerns about this. What we want to do though is we want to identify groups of people who are reliably uh, at high enough risk of uh, developing TB that uh, it's going to be worthwhile uh, uh, applying a systematic test and treatment program. But uh, at low enough risk of significant side effects that we can safely do that in a supervised GP context. And so the training works through uh, when to think about TB, epidemiologic risk factors and so forth, around the testing for latent TB, interpreting uh, different diagnostic tests and how they work, uh, about how to simply exclude active disease, and then where people are under the age of 35, have a positive test for latent TB, have had active disease excluded, normal liver function tests, they're in a good position to uh, offer latent TB therapy in the community. And we have these pathways where if there's any uncertainty, if there are uh, people who fall outside of those parameters, they can go back into existing tertiary pathways, which are now a little bit stronger because GPs have had that contact in, in tertiary care settings. Now, th this is small and fledgling, uh, and we've had lots of challenges. Um, certainly, as we move from a centralized TB program into a broadly decentralized system, um, there's a lot of uh, challenges around uh, monitoring and documenting outcomes here. Uh, we've started with a couple of formal pilot sites. 
uh, which um, uh, have now finished their uh, initial phase of evaluation uh, and are in some longer term follow-up. Uh, but we've had uh, additional funding now uh, from uh, uh, both from GP uh, clinical practice networks and from the state government uh, to expand that to uh, further sites uh, over the next 12 months. Uh, and ultimately looking to build up a model that can be rolled out more broadly where it's necessary across Victoria, but we, all, we hope also a, a resource that can be used elsewhere. Um, we're also looking at a variety of ways to um, uh, monitor outcomes and to assist GPs in that. Uh, at the moment, we're using a red cap, data cap, uh, a red cap uh, database system uh, that allows some uh, remote uh, observation of these things. Um, but I'm very interested, as, as people who know me will, will realize, uh, around ideas uh, for national notification of latent TB, uh, partly to help us understand the, the magnitude of the issues here, but also to help us focus and, and direct our response towards this, this issue. Uh, and, and finally, uh, we are going ahead with uh, an isomized based strategy uh, because we think that it's here and we think there's a real issue that can be managed with our existing tools. However, uh, we're also building infrastructure that we can then uh, bring in new innovations uh, like uh, short course therapy with rapapentin when it, if and when it becomes available in the near future. Okay. So th this is really the outstanding question for where should we treat latent TB? You know, can it be scaled up safely and effectively through community-based settings? And, and this is essentially the approach that we're taking. We're looking at a gradual clinical uh, expansion, um, uh, trying to evaluate that at every stage, uh, particularly around safety. Uh, but also, as the programs become larger and larger, we want to be able to think uh, epidemiologically about the impact that they're having. So watch this space. So this brings me to the last point, which is why. Why is a, a short one, I think? Uh, I don't have any research to offer you uh, in this space. But I think I feel strongly, and I, I hope you feel strongly too, that latent TB therapy um, offers real value to individuals. If we appropriately select people who are at risk of developing active disease, we have an opportunity to intervene and prevent the, um, the, the pain and suffering that we all see uh, from active disease. It's also true that that sits alongside a uh, public health vision for TB elimination. Um, to me, that is a, a secondary but important outcome. Um, epidemiologically, we will never reduce TB incidence in Australia without uh, either coming to the end of eliminating TB globally and then waiting 150 years just for everything to sort of sift itself out, or by tackling the issue of latent TB, which is where more than 90% of our uh, local TB comes from. So the outstanding question that I want to leave this group of people with uh, is one that I think is core to the vision of, of what the CRE is about and what this community is about, which is this. How do we ensure that latent TB is managed in a way that is effective and efficient and ethical, acceptable? How do we make sure that it's supported by all of the stakeholders, by communities and families and individuals, by governments and programs? Um, how is it that we use our experience here for uh, the benefit of people who currently live in Australia, but also to contribute to a global vision of TB elimination? Um, that's uh, maybe an easy question to ask. <laughs> Clearly, uh, 100,000 uh, closely related and difficult questions in there to answer. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to be here today and part of the group that's asking a lot of those questions. So. Uh, I'm going to come to the end of my talk, but not to the end of the story. So thank you.